Hello. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get the names down. And um, we're moving on to the material for test three, your final uh, test. And we're doing the age of Andrew Jackson, a great man history term, uh, because he um, so much was associated with his popular image. And he was a president uh, for eight years during much of this time. So um, before we move on again, are there any questions? Any questions or comments? Feel free to, uh, to unmute yourself. Please recall also on the, um, on the announcement that I've given, uh, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to be here on Monday. So uh, we'll see how we go through this material we're either going to go through it right now, or I'm going to uh, give a video from a previous semester on the topic, or I might even do both. All right. So no questions. You guys doing okay? Um, no. Um, so the last Zoom is on Wednesday next week. Oh. The last Zoom, uh, oh my goodness, yes, I believe so. Um, yeah, I need to look at my schedule here. I hadn't considered that, but that very well might be true. All right, no problem, Sabrina. All right, let me make sure I have all the names. All right. All right, great. All right, so I have everyone. So we're going to, I'm going to share the screen, okay? So the first one on Andrew Jackson, it's one section. It's one long section. All right, and uh, it pertains to um, the alleged democratization that happened during this time, right? Remember, we have a republic. We don't technically have a democracy. Um, a republic is a mixed government, right? We still have offices like Supreme Court justices, cabinet members, uh, especially, especially Supreme Court justices, because they're not only handpicked by elected officials, but they are um, chosen for life, basically, right? For good behavior. And um, so that's important to note. We still have a republic, but relative to the generation before, right? They contend that in the late 1820s and the early and throughout the 1830s, that our republic was democratized. All right, and, and how how did this happen? Um, or yeah, how did it happen? I don't mean as far as causation. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in that. Uh, but what happened? Uh, first of all, uh, so for one, right, you have um, states, many states, dropping their property requirements for citizenship and thus allowing non-property owning white men to become citizens, all right? So that's one way uh, that, that the Republic was democratized was the, um, the franchise, the citizenship uh, population uh, increased the proportion of the, of the population who uh, were granted citizenship rights uh, was increased. Then in addition to that, uh, you had an old system of uh, nomination uh, of candidates uh, at the at the federal level, and they were they went through the Senate, and it was a self-appointed elite called the caucus, C A U C U S, and they would they would appoint those who they wanted to run for office, and so not any regular person could technically run for federal office uh, because it went through this self-appointed elite in the Senate. And Andrew Jackson and others, right, who, who followed the line of the Democratic Republicans, they got rid of the Republican part and they just went by Democrats uh, at this time, the Democratic Party, and they wanted to put an end to this. They wanted to democratize the nomination of candidates. And so they implemented the uh, party convention system. And on paper, the party convention system sounds wonderfully democratic. Uh, you go, uh, the, the political party, 
uh, advertises through newspapers, et cetera, uh, times of, of, of conventions. And any citizen and member of the party could come to the uh, convention and nominate anyone he or she likes uh, from that convention uh, who just, requir just required citizenship and affiliation with a party. And so now, technically, right, um, Joe Bob can, can uh, put down his, his farm implements and run for office through the local convention system. And then whoever won at the local convention would go on to a higher regional convention. Whoever won from that went to the state or federal convention and so forth. So on paper, at least, it looked as if any common citizen now, including non-property owning white men, uh, could run for office, all right? Then also political participation. You look in the back of Alan Brinkley's textbook and political participation supposedly, uh, you know, uh, jumped leaps and bounds. Uh, you, you have in one case, right, I have here, for example, the percentage of eligible citizens right here who voted for a presidential candidate rose from 26.9% of eligible voters in 1824 election to 80.2% in the presidential election of 1840. That's pretty impressive. All right. And that is just the uh, federal level for president. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, even if the, the increase was not as dramatic at other levels and for other offices, there is evidence of political participation increasing uh, across the board. Um, you also have a local uh, city, urban and, and other uh, mainly urban uh, organizations that, that had a bit of a grassroot um, image to them at least, if not reality. Uh, because sometimes it was those the self-appointed elite in the cities who ran them. But it, uh, a lot of city organizations, according to Edward Pesson in his book, uh, organized uh, on their own volition outside the political structure and for everything, for practical issues like sewage and sanitation, crime problems, and, and trying to implement a, a new police force um, to uh, more idealistic associations, like trying to uh, implement uh, uh, widespread universal education for all children, uh, trying to create more almshouses to get the homeless and the poor uh, out of their situation and to improve their lot, etc. So you have a lot of associations that people joined uh, at this time, as far as the, the argument for democratization that, that people not only more people were citizens, not only more citizens now had an opportunity to run for office, but also more citizens were participating in the republic's functions, uh, namely in elections and so forth, and forming a lot of, of local organizations and, and participating civically, all right, uh, in government. So at any rate, you have evidence for all this uh, in the primary sources. And um, uh, you could even give credit to Andrew Jackson and some of the Democrats for wanting to, uh, if you do see this as a good thing, as far as a system of checks and balances versus the democratic impulse, uh, they wanted to um, they wanted to get rid of the electoral college system and have the president and other offices. Well, it's just mainly the president and vice president um, elected by popular vote rather than through the electoral college system. Obviously, they didn't do so. We still have it to this day, uh, but they tried to. All right. So you have evidence of things like this. You have a lot of uh, public rallies and a lot of hoopla on election days and so forth. Uh, they would they would sell beer and alcohol. Uh, they would have fireworks and parades, uh, flying eagles, all all the um, you know the uh, accoutrements of of civic engagement and civic pride and patriotism and so forth, you see this. You have a lot of political rallies in which to a limited extent, uh, the politicians were asked questions from their constituency and addressed those questions uh, for crowds. Uh, you had uh, the continued tradition of political discourse in the newspapers, oftentimes uh, still 
by way of an alias and not your real name to protect your, uh, you know, your anonymity. Uh, but still, you had a lot of political discourse um, as well. All right. But then other people contend that revisionist historians, they look at this and say, okay, some of the obvious things, right? Okay, great. Uh, increased enfranchisement and opportunities for the common white man. Uh, but what about African Americans, right? What about immigrants? What about women? Um, and then also uh, in the in the far west, what about the treatment of Hispanics and uh, Asian Americans? And so we'll get to that soon. And then um, there was an economic component to this democratizing trend in the 1820s and 1830s as well. And that was is that um, there was an increase. Uh, sale and, and uh, offering of lands to more people. So there was a lot of, a lot of land transactions and a lot of squatting, uh, people trespassing on property that was not their own, uh, staying on it, improving it, and getting the first dibs, to, either the first dibs to buy it, um, or, or even at times having it granted to them as squatters' rights. All right. Um, you also had judges at the local positions and other levels besides that connected to the, um, you know, the primary judicial system and appellate system uh, that became elected uh, rather than appointed. And some people, you know, were a little bit alarmed by that. And we're going to get back to that. And so, uh, but going back to the economic part, you had the Charles River Bridge case. And with the Charles River Bridge case, uh, a, a group of Dartmouth educated uh, kind of old wealth gentlemen had a bridge that they built over the Charles River. And they contended that it was implied in the language of their charter that no one else could build a rival bridge near them. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court under Roger B. Taney uh, made its decision that, um, you know, they wanted to make a definitive message that we have a capitalist free economy and that if um, Joe Bob and, and some other, you know, quote, redneck uh, from Kentucky or Tennessee from the frontier states wants to build a rival bridge with these Dartmouth Northeastern snobs, uh, he has the right to do so. It's a free land of competition and opportunity. So you had um, uh, also more easily accessible credit uh, by way of, uh, they were called wildcat banks at this time uh, for their tendency to lend a bit irresponsibly, but nevertheless lend very generously uh, to the common folk. And remember, it, it takes money to make money, right? And the main avenues for which people achieved the American dream were not yet through academia, but arguably entrepreneurial and starting a business uh, or through uh, cash crop farming, both which required overhead, money that you gotta pay right off the bat before you see a penny of profit. So oftentimes, as, as the saying goes of taking money to make money, uh, you needed a loan uh, to get on your feet. And so loans became more accessible at this time as well. <clears throat> All right, um, but let's see here. Uh, then with going back to revisionist history, right, where uh, they tend to revise this rose colored image of the Jacksonian period is they look at quotes from people like Alexa de Tocqueville. Um, de Tocqueville uh, was a French traveler uh, who uh, had aristocratic heritage and came here to um, observe our prison system. And instead he became so enamored by, so interested in Americans and their culture and their habits, et cetera, that he ended up writing profusely on it and having a published book that became an American classic called Democracy in America. But in it, I would make the argument that um, it's been a while since I've read it, but from my, if my memory serves me correctly, um, yes, he praises America in, in some respects, but he also has plenty of criticism for America as well. As for one, right, he's just, he's at a, at a loss for how, um, how egalitarian Americans were socially, right? As far as their culture and how um, the, the average expectations of the average person. Because remember, he's coming from, from, from France and yes, he had seen the French Revolution, 
but then he saw the time kind of the clock metaphorically go backward uh, with the restoration of the Bourbon Kings. And so he saw a much bigger dichotomy between the haves and the have nots back in Europe and in France in particular. And he saw a sense of, of, of kind of apathy, right? A kind of a, what Lyndon B. Johnson later on will call like a culture of poverty where the people just kind of give up and they look for alternative criminal means to get wealth and, or they become dependent upon the government. Um, he saw that uh, back in Europe itself. And he contrasted with that with what he observed here in the United States. What he observed is he said that Americans are just amazing and that they will, uh, they will, um, you know, that what's the word where, whereby you're, um, you can never be satisfied. They had an, ins an insatiable, uh, an insatiable appetite and expectation uh, to improve their lot and to achieve that nebulous American dream, right? Of rising socially and economically. And so um, he said, Americans will build a house and before the roof's even finished, he said, they won't be content any longer with that small property and they'll sell that property and go for somewhere bigger and better further west. And so um, he, uh, there's an anecdote of a, a, a French aristocrat coming into a tavern and someone cuts ahead of him and he says, basically, I beg your pardon. Don't you know who I am? I'm the uh, Viscount of such and such and started uh, citing his titles. And the American supposedly said, that might mean something back in Europe, but that doesn't mean a thing here in America and spit tobacco on his shoe and walked ahead of him into the tavern. And so he said like Americans have this incredible self-esteem whereby the average American expects to become rich, expects to do well, expects to have opportunities come his or her way, um, et cetera. And to him, it, that was just um, very uh, surprising for lack of a better adjective uh, compared to uh, what he had observed and experienced back in Europe itself. So at any rate, um, he also contended that, that the Americans tended to, um, that with, with his version of American democratic culture, he thought that they're, they're kind, they're, they're sort of tended to occur a, uh, an adherence to the most common lowest denominator. Uh, so that for instance, right, so the average um, frontier, uh, poor American, let's say in the frontier areas of the West, like Tennessee and Kentucky, right, at this time, is that um, culture tended to gravitate downward toward that demographic. And so when people ran for office, they tried to boast, ironically, because it seems ironic compared to the generation before and before and before that, they tried to boast of how poor and, and they had been and in what poverty stricken circumstances they had extricated themselves from, right? And, and had arisen from. And so that, that was the way to, to run for office is to look like a self-made man, look like someone who was born in the poor, you know, equivalent of a ghetto, uh, the poor frontier, but made it by his own pluck and luck uh, pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, right, as a self-made man and uh, had made something of himself through hard work and talent, et cetera. And so there was an adherence to this kind of, um, you know, frontier culture, uh, this, this kind of, you know, um, you know, and I don't mean this tongue in cheek, but with today's, you know, association with the term, but kind of a redneck culture. And so at any rate, um, the improper grammar, um, a bit of a, a xenophobia, right? And remember, that's kind of a, a hateful fear of anything unfamiliar uh, to you and to what you've grown up with. Um, so there's almost an xenophobic um, aversion toward people in the big cities, in the Northeast, for instance, toward intellectuals, because intellectuals you know, college educated intellectuals were still such a small minority um, against immigrants, against Hispanics and Asians in the West um, in, in the mid 1800s. And so, uh, you know, to him, this wasn't all good. 
uh, this adherence to a low common denominator, this kind of redneck blue collar culture that seemed to become uh, the primary uh, dominant and mainstream culture, right? And Andrew Jackson, this fit perfectly for him. He was, he was his demographics, his background, his even temperament uh, fit in perfectly with this time period. Uh, for one, uh, demographically, he came from Scots-Irish descent. Remember, the Scots-Irish had been uh, removed from their lands at least twice uh, before they moved to the, um, to the Americas. They had been at, developed a reputation for rebellion uh, and, and for being the, the, I hate to say it, but, but the scum of the earth to the English. And so um, they were encouraged and allowed uh, to migrate um, the Scots-Irish from Europe uh, into North America. But you had one case, I believe it was North Carolina, uh, in, 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 or maybe not North Carolina because their frontier accepted a lot. Um, but there, were, there was a state that basically said, Scots-Irish, you're not welcome. Unless you're gonna fight with the rebellion, uh, don't bother coming into this state. Uh, such was the kind of stigma that they had developed. So they came in and a lot of them were poor. They had, didn't have any capital or money with them. Uh, they didn't have a college education. Uh, they didn't have a lot of skills, uh, artisan wise, et cetera, and much to offer. So a lot of them came as blue collar workers and as farmers trying to squat on land, et cetera. And so Daniel Boone and other um, spokesmen for the Scots-Irish encouraged them during the War for Independence uh, to come into uh, through the, uh, the famous gap of the Appalachians, uh, the Cumberland Gap into present day Tennessee and Kentucky. And so amongst that group were um, Andrew Jackson's parents. Uh, his father died tied to a, my, uh, a lumber accident uh, when uh, his, his mom was pregnant with him, so he never got to know his dad. And then his mother and at least one of his brothers, if not both, uh, died during the War for Independence. And so he was orphaned by the age of 14, uh, sent to live with an allegedly abusive uncle. And he ran away not long after that from that uncle. And so, um, you know, he definitely came from humble origins. As a kid, he tried to fight against the British and received a, a, a very well-known scar over his brow uh, for defying a British soldier when he was captured by them uh, and, and from the man's saber. Um, so uh, uh, when he got older, as he grew older, um, he apprenticed himself to a well-known attorney. But in the meantime, while he's apprenticing himself to try to rise up as an attorney, he also did so as a land surveyor uh, which was a common way up, as like George Washington could attest. While he was trying to work his way up, he, according to the primary sources, he engaged in very blue collar, frontier-like um, compatible behavior. Uh, he got in a lot of fist fights. He got in several duels, some of which he actually took lives, uh, one of which uh, uh, rendered him with a bullet in his chest that he carried to his death. Um, and so uh, one time, even as a judge, he took off his robe and threatened to uh, physically contend against a man who was refusing to come to court. And so he, he kept that, that fiery frontier-like temper and temperament, uh, that kind of Manichaeanism, right? Manichaeanism is that you don't see things uh, as so much exist in, in shady gray, but you see everything simplistically as right and wrong, good versus evil. Etc. right, which was kind of tied to that blue collared frontier culture and worldview. And so uh, you see that like when he fought against the British and, and the hatred he kept for the British, you saw that when he fought against Native Americans and the ire that he showed uh, that he directed toward the Native Americans. Uh, you see also uh, his seeming, you know, uh, if not indifference, uh, refusal to take a stand against slavery and his use of slaves. He had slaves himself. And so, um, you know, you definitely have plenty to work with with revisionist historiography uh, and revising this, this rose-colored court image of the Jacksonian period as being this wonderful time of democratization, right? 
And so uh, one of those cases is in the case of the Trail of Tears. And you'll read that in this section. So note, right, how the efforts to which the quote five civilized tribes tried to demonstrate their willingness to assimilate uh, to kind of wasp uh, Euro-American culture, right? A lot of them accepted uh, public schools or private Christian schools. A lot of them accepted Christianity. Uh, many of them uh, wrote like at, at, at Shoda, uh, the Cherokee wrote out their own language, um, language system, their own uh, Republican form of government with checks and balances modeled after that of the United States, uh, engaged in cash crop farming, uh, engaged in metallurgical uh, arts, right? Uh, and trying to, to become progressive and accept that which was considered modern or new. And so you have evidence of that, but despite that, ultimately, uh, several states issued what might be likened to eminent domain laws today, right? It, like, remember, like if you, um, you live on land that a local state or federal government decides is going to be utilized for a, uh, a state or national park, for a hospital, for a freeway, for an elementary public school, et cetera. They can contend that that uh, that land is 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 imminent. It's preeminent. Uh, it's more important uh, civically uh, than than the common, you know, uh, private property, and hence you must sell that land to the government uh, for the general well-being, for the general good. And so they basically did that with the Cherokee and the Choctaw and these other tribes. They forced them uh, in the creek, etc. They, they forced them to sell their lands. They gave them ultimatums at the state legislator. And remember, these state legislators were very popularly elected um, and represented the will of, of a lot of, of, of white American men, at least, uh, who had voted for them. And so um, there was a defense, a legal defense by the Cherokee in particular, and it made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And remember, arguably, the Supreme Court uh, the idea is, right, is that you have 25 people, let's say 25 of us in the class or something, and we had, somehow got, went on a class trip and, and became marooned on an island and decided to, to go by pure democracy. Whatever 13 of that 25 wants uh, comes into fruition. And so, you know, I, I'm using kind of hyperbole here, but what if 13 of us decided to enslave the other 12, right? And so sometimes, democracy, as they say, can be like two wolves and one lamb uh, voting on what's for dinner. Obviously, the two wolves are going to vote, outvote the lamb on eating the lamb. And so at any rate, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for. This was all warned uh, about uh, by Alexa de Tocqueville uh, in his book, Democracy in America. He was concerned that the majority was going to steamroll over the minority, right? over the numerical minority groups. And so at any rate, you have evidence of that here with the Native Americans. And so um, when it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court arguably is meant to, um, you know, with some of Madison and other the Founding Fathers writings, in the spirit of Montesquieu, there's supposed to be a sense of balance. So the House of Reps, for instance, they are to represent the will of the majority of people because they're popularly elected, right? And hence, they're, they're beholden to what, in some ways, at least to a limited extent, uh, to what the majority of people want. But sometimes the majority can be rash. Sometimes the majority can become tyrannical, right? Plato, Aristotle, and others had warned about this thousands of years ago. And so in that case, right, you need a group of, of, of individuals, and let's face it, in this case, it's men, uh, wealthy, educated men, uh, with the Supreme Court, you need a group of individuals who are cushioned and protected from popular opinion, whose offices do not depend upon popular election, for them to make the tough decisions that defend the minority groups, the numerical minority, because after all, someone has to or someone ought to, says the reasoning of, of the spirit of laws, uh, the spirit of checks and balances, right? So at any rate, that's exactly what the Supreme Court did. They sided with the Cherokee. And because what they did is that uh, on a technicality is uh, the there were several treaties 
uh, federal treaties that granted those lands to the Cherokee, to the Choctaw, to the Creek, etc. And they said that a federal level clause or treaty supersedes a mere state law that tells them that they have to sell their land. That if, if there is a, you know, a conflict between a federal treaty made by DC and a mere state law that the federal uh, level treaty uh, should prevail, should be supreme. So at any rate, on account of that, because of the federal treaties, the Cherokee were told they could keep their land. Well, President Andrew Jackson uh, defies that and says, no, I have a mandate from the people, like the Spanish word mandato. I have a command uh, from the people. This is what the majority wants. And again, kind of being Manichaean of just seeing things in black and white, uh, he acted as if the will of the majority is almost mystically always right, uh, morally and, um, you know, logically. So at any rate, uh, he contended, hey, this is what the people in those states want. And then he took a paternalistic uh, approach as well toward the Native Americans and stated that they are incapable of fully assimilating to Anglo or, or Euro-American culture and institutions. And in that they are allegedly, supposedly, incapable of assimilating, of dropping their own culture and traditions and ways and embracing that of white America, right? In that they are allegedly incapable of doing that, conflict will become inevitable uh, as like oil and water, uh, the Native Americans and the, the, the white Americans will not ever mix. Uh, and so because of that, he said war and conflict will become inevitable, unavoidable, and the Native Americans just by numbers and technology alone will surely lose. So hence, it is for their own good. It is for their own future protection, he said, that we force them to sell their lands to the state governments uh, for their voters who were covered in this land, right, this fertile land, uh, force them to be removed to a Western area of Indian territory for their own protection, supposedly, right? And that namely that's in uh, Western Arkansas and Eastern Oklahoma uh, today. So they were sent in the infamous Trails of Tears, right? There were several of them, but one of the most famous, uh, over a sixth of the people um, uh, died uh, en route. Uh, many of them contracted dysentery uh, the uh, situation there in the, uh, on the reservations was rather poor and chaotic uh, when they first got there. Uh, there was a, a, law, a big sense of depression and apathy uh, quoted in primary sources uh, of within and amongst the Native Americans. And of course, some of the Native Americans even resulted, uh, even um, reverted to violence against their authoritative figures who had given their consent uh, to this trail of tears, all right? So be careful what you ask for, right? This section states as far as having more democracy and putting the majority of people uh, at the proverbial driver's seat or driver's wheel. All right, so any questions so far? All right. So some people would use the term in, in the negative connotation of it, at least, right? Um, and that was uh, populism. And with populism, right, uh, populism connotes, again, kind of reverting to the lowest common denominator, uh, being able to, uh, you know, push the buttons of, of, of the average American voter and see not only what he loves, not only what he covets and desires, but also, right, uh, what he hates and what he fears, and to take advantage of that. And, uh, and so there's like an anti-institutional, uh, more romantic view of populism, where it's like, heck with the established elites, let's do what the common people want. This is our land, a government of, by, and for the people, right? So don't get me wrong, there, there's a, a, a positive connotation to populism uh, ruled by the popular, 
you know, common will and, and for the common person and citizen. But there's also what I'm putting here is the negative connotation, right? That uh, sometimes, right, if they hate Native Americans, if they hate Hispanics, if they hate Asian Americans, et cetera, uh, as a politician, you run with that. You take advantage of that. Uh, you use that group as the other, right, in psychology, uh, that, that group that uh, you dehumanize. And, and sometimes, right, like Emil Durkheim and other sociologists contend that sometimes, you know, uh, putting people under a negative stigma, like criminals or immigrants or others, right, can have a very positively unifying effect on the majority of people that are kind of scapegoating that group uh, can bring about a beneficial unity. And so, you know, uh, not to get conspiratorial, but sometimes, right, this could serve uh, the politicians well and getting everyone united in hating the Native Americans, et cetera, and uh, utilizing that unity uh, for their own ends. So something to think about, okay? So you see a map and the famous picture of the Trail of Tears. Professor? Yes, please. Yeah, can we use that in comparison to today? Oh gosh, yes. Please go on. And in what way? Um, basically how you were talking about politicians using that, you know, for their own will, which I feel like still is equivalent to today. I feel like a lot of people are misinformed through social media. So I kind of wanted to use that as, as a comparison. That is an absolutely appropriate comparison. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So xenophobia about Mexican immigrants crossing the border. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh-huh. No problem. All right. And so, uh, yeah, it is. I, I, I think that's a very appropriate uh, tie uh, to contemporary realities. Uh, then in addition to that, right, you have expansion. And a lot of this is happening at about the same time in the 1830s, but also the 1840s. And the argument is, right, is that um, what, what I revolved it around was Turner's thesis, okay? Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner wrote a famous thesis in the 1890s, and he states basically that which makes America what it is, right? That's what that which constitutes Americana, if you will, is meritocracy. It's rising or falling by your own effort and your own talent. And let's face it, your own good or poor luck, right? And he states that the West helped establish that attribute, that defining attribute, that the West opened up meritocracy uh, definitively for the American people. So he states, right, that the West, first of all, was equally dangerous for everyone, that some of the, the, the common, you know, ailments, the common accidents, the common acts of violence uh, that, that could incur, uh, someone could incur moving westwardly uh, could have happened to anyone, right? And so I kind of think of like Joseph Campbell and, and on mythology and on Americans' mythology with the West of, of the, uh, the hero's journey, right? Like um, you see with the, the primary character, the protagonist, and a lot of famous uh, literary works and movies, etc., is the hero, right, has to go through conflict, uh, has to experience uh, in, in, uh, improvement in character and in depth, et cetera, right? And what better way uh, to, uh, to become a better person, to become stronger, et cetera, than to survive uh, great obstacles, right? And, and, and great adversity. So that's one part of his thesis that he tries to uh, defend that claim with, right? Is trying to convey the West as being equally dangerous for everybody, okay? But then secondly, he also contends that the West afforded a myriad of economic opportunities for everybody. That if you were quick enough as an improvising entrepreneur, for instance, right? 
to start up a business, to learn about um, a commodity or a service that you could offer the majority of people that were moving into the West, if you were quick enough on your feet, uh, that virtually anyone could make it and make a quick buck, um, et cetera. So uh, gosh, where to begin with Turner's thesis? Uh, to give some context to the West, the 1820s, uh, you see the democratization of the fur trade and more and more people moving into the far West uh, by way of what would later become officially uh, the overland trails, uh, namely the, um, the Oregon Trail, the California or Mormon Trail that comes from it, and also the Santa Fe Trail to the south. Uh, most of them coming from Missouri uh, into California or Oregon or into the, the, the Southwest, uh, New Mexico, Arizona area. So at any rate, as um, I, I could put something online to show you an old uh, hi historical argumentative assignment uh, where you could, you could take a look if you like, uh, but of course you wouldn't have to do it. It's an older one and it'd just be there just for your own enrichment if you wanted me to, but uh, there's a, I have a number on that, just basically saying there's not much of a thesis. It's just saying that the West became uh, kind of democratized and as to who came there, because at first it was afforded uh, to monopolies, uh, the Hudson Bay Company and these other big monopolistic companies, right? Representing their crown and, and countries back in Europe. And the Americans began to work, a lot of them, uh, for the Hudson Company, for instance, in the Oregon Territory. And one of them, a German immigrant, uh, in, in a, 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 an Americanized uh, immigrant uh, named John Jacob Astor, uh, broke free from uh, his employers and began, began his own rival company there in Oregon and uh, in what would become Astoria, named after him. And so, uh, you have people like um, uh, Manuel Lisa, uh, L-I-S-A. Manuel Lisa was a Spaniard, and he began uh, highly, uh, very proactively trying to um, uh, recruit Americans to come and trap beaver and otter for him. Because at, at, at this time in the, in the early 1820s, uh, the average profit margin as far as what it costs for you to, to get over there and, and to, to, uh, to use a, a, a trapper and, 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 and catch some of these, or even just buy them at the local rendezvous, these areas where they would have like a flea market, if you will, and kind of a carnival atmosphere. They'd meet in the spring at, at places like the Dales, D-A-L-L-E-S in Idaho. And uh, you could buy a, um, a pelt and then sell it in certain areas on the East Coast or even back to China in the form of hats and, 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 and coats, et cetera, you could sell it for 800 times the price that you had bought it for. So like an 800% profit rate. It was crazy. So at any rate, it became a huge moneymaker. And those poor animals, you know, uh, uh, just a great... Um, catastrophic drop in their population. And so at any rate, um, more Americans and immigrants and others began going into the West during the 1820s, uh, just, just doing it on their own, like the old French runners of the forest. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this, but it's like Courrier de, de Bois, the runners of the forest were like the French fur trappers, right? And they oftentimes did things independently uh, to take out the middleman who would take a lot of their earnings from them. And so you have that happening in the 1820s. Then by the 1840s, uh, especially by around 43, you have some famous expeditions that came into the far west and they, they, they gave a lot of um, propaganda, a lot of publicity to the far west and supposedly trying to promote people uh, to move there. And so uh, you have missionaries, right? Um, you had missionaries in Oregon. Um, whereby uh, they ended up uh, giving kind of a bi autobiographical account of their lives, and it was being publicized uh, in the East Coast, and then they ended up um, uh, being killed 
uh, and, uh, and, and they were seen as martyrs. You literally had lots of church organizations of a plethora of different denominations uh, getting together and raising funds to send missionaries into Oregon and into the far west uh, to finish where the martyred family had begun. I have the family's name on here. It's presently eluding me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but at any rate, um, I want to say, I want to say Whitman, Narcissa Whitman and her husband. But at any rate, um, so you had missionaries, right, uh, flooding in. And of course, you had the birth of the uh, of the Mormon uh, denomination or religion, and uh, with um, with uh, Brigham Young uh, taking reins right after uh, Joseph Smith was was uh, murdered, and uh, making a contract with the U.S. to move into present day Utah, and so uh, you got a lot of publicity with that, and thousands of Mormons, uh, uh, tens of thousands who came in. Uh, with them. You, in addition to religious figures, uh, you also had just uh, common families. Uh, the Bidwell Bartleson group, right, uh, came into Mexican California, and the, uh, what was the equivalent in Oregon to the Bidwell Bartleson group? Uh, no, that was the Whitman group. I apologize. Um, but the Whitman group into Oregon and the Bidwell Bartleson group into Mexican California, they, they developed two, uh, two, I, two sources of identification that ended up serving well for future Americans coming in to those areas. And those two parts of identification were one, that they were innocuous or harmless. They came with their women and children uh, a lot of them didn't have much in weaponry. Uh, there wasn't a large number of them at first. And so hence uh, Vallejo, that the city of Vallejo is named after, uh, he got to make the decision um, in Mexican California. And he decided that, that the Bidwell Bartisan Group and these other Americans coming in through the gap of the Sierra Nevada mountains between California and Nevada uh, were, were harmless. And then secondly, that they were enterprising was the generic term that was used. And enterprising, right, to me is kind of broad. It's that you are not only hardworking, but you are, you embrace that which is novel uh, economically. So they were establishing grist and, and lumber mills and uh, using saws and, and other types of, of mechanical implements that were seen to be very progressive at that time. So hence that they were gonna improve the economy, right? And contribute to the Mexican Californian uh, economy. So the Bidwell Bartleson group, according to Chicano historians, right? Was unwittingly, unknowingly coming in like a Trojan horse, they say, right? And you know the story with the Mycenaeans coming into Troy and they hide, their soldiers hide inside the, uh, the Trojan horse and the Trojans unknowingly allow them right in through Priam's gates, right in his walls. And in the middle of the night, they come out of the horse and attack. So the Bidwell Bartleson group is seen in, in that light by Chicano historians that they made Americans look as if they were going to just simply economically improve um, the, the region and that they were harmless, right? And so the same thing with the other expedition uh, that came into Oregon uh, they were allowed in by a gentleman named uh, McLaughlin, uh, who was the, the British official uh, in charge of the Oregon Territory, claiming it from the Native Americans long before that. So at any rate, Americans came into the, what was called the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and they came into the Sacramento Valley of California uh, in progressively large numbers during the 1840s. Okay. And... Um, then in addition to that, you had the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848. Uh, we had two main invasions, one uh, from the American Southwest into uh, Coahuila, Mexico, and the north of Mexico under Zachary Taylor, and another one under Winfield Scott uh, in the south that followed the route of um, Hernan Cortez uh, into Mexico City. And so uh, the Americans are gonna win uh, that war, 
uh, that two year war. And they're going to claim they're going to force Mexico to sell um, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, uh, parts of Utah, parts of Colorado, etc. A huge swath of land. I have a map of it. Um, okay, and so um, in the midst of that Mexican American War, uh, the peace treaty was signed on February 2nd, 1848, and uh, January 24th, just like eight days before, uh, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, and it was uh, soon publicized. So it couldn't have been worse timing for Mexico to officially lose California, and then right in those days when they were given handing California over, a gold rush ensued and was going to ensure the influx of a huge uh, majority of Anglo Americans coming into Hispanic and Native American California. All right. Um, and then going back into that war, um, one of the causes of it was that um, there was a dispute over, I mean, the first and foremost, really, is there was friction over the loss of Texas right? Uh, Texas and Coahuila were one state united uh, beneath it and um, under Spain and then under Mexico. And um, I have the data on this, I believe on number two. Uh, then uh, very generous land grants were opened up to uh, Anglo settlers into Mexican Texas uh, under, especially under um, leaders who were uh, seen as like a provisional governor uh, to answer to the Mexican government and to be a loyal middleman between the, uh, these unknown Anglo immigrants and the uh, Mexican authorities. So the famous one, right, was Moses and then his son, Stephen Austin. And um, as far as Chicano history goes, right, uh, the, from their perspective, uh, the American immigrants were ingrates. They came in, they took advantage of great land opportunities, great business opportunities, and they didn't do their part. Uh, they didn't learn Spanish, they didn't become Roman Catholic, and they didn't abide by Mexican laws as they were supposed to. Uh, one of the Mexican laws stated that they could not bring slaves uh, into the territory. And many of them coming from, many of them were Scots-Irish coming from uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, and many were uh, poor white men coming from the lower south of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. So a lot of them were Southerners. And remember with Southern tradition, it was very libertarian, especially the Scots-Irish, uh, that you're fearful of and hateful toward government. You don't like it strong and centralized. Government, leave me alone and let me be autonomous. Let me be my own boss, right? And then not to mention the racist component. Uh, that there's plenty of evidence for against Hispanics. And so at any rate, they came in and um, there was a uh, gentleman, uh, Mier y Terran, uh, who came up and um, did an investigation and he decided that, that Texas was about to be lost to the Anglos if something were not done. So in response to that, the Mexican government instituted the April 6th colonization law and the April 6th colonization law, it stated that you had to abide by the formal requirements or you would be deported. There would be no further uh, American immigration into Mexican Texas. And, and also you had to pay your taxes. And so at any rate, under the April 6th colonization law, the Anglos um, were very angry about this. Caught in the middle supposedly is Stephen Austin. Um, there had already been a Fredonian, it was called the Fredonian Revolt by the Anglos trying to break free militarily. And Stephen Austin himself uh, squashed that Anglo rebellion uh, in, in loyalty to the Mexican government that had gr granted him the status um, of, of a provisional governor um, over, the, um, over this region. And he even complained about the Anglos there and stated that the first generation was law-abiding, largely assimilated, uh, 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 married Mexican-American women, uh, or at this time Mexican women, um, and uh, raised their kids as Catholics, et cetera. But he said the second and third generation were just awful. 
uh, in, in, in their defiance of Mexican norms and laws and expectations, et cetera, and that he needed more soldiers up there. So he felt like he was a good, loyal uh, middleman. So he went down to Mexico uh, uh, to try to serve as an adjudicator, like a referee, and stating that the Anglo-Americans would not put up with the April 6th law for long, lest they rebel, that there needed to be uh, at least a con some concession, if not only just allowing them to keep their slaves in Mexican Texas, even though it was forbidden throughout the rest of Texas. And um, he got in somewhat, according to the primary sources, an ego clash with President Gomez Farias. And Gomez Farias had him arrested for 15 months, put in a jail cell, and he supposedly became dejected. I'm talking about Stephen Austin, and wrote a letter to the Cabildo, the city council of San Antonio, uh, stating, uh, do whatever you feel you need to do. I could not come to compromise with the Mexican government. And so, um, and then the, the last straw, so to speak, uh, the spark, uh, arguably, uh, to the loss of Texas was the uh, new constitution under General Santa Ana as, new, as the new president. Uh, his, uh, he had the, the Siete Leyes, he had the Bases Organicas, he had a couple very uber conservative constitutions, uh, whereby he stated that he could dissolve the Diputacion or, or Congress at will, uh, that he would handpick the governors and no longer would they be elected, and that the governors had the, the power to shut down the local cabildos or city councils. And hence, right, it really did curtail um, uh, representative democracy, uh, this new ultra conservative constitution, and not to mention local autonomy, right, the local regions doing as they please. Because you got to remember their technical leadership and representation down in Mexico City, you know, is it's like 2000 miles away from them with lack of, you know, with real poor infrastructure and so forth. So they saw themselves as like the frontier and under separate circumstances from people down by Mexico City itself. So at any rate, um, there was a rebellion in, um, in Zacatecas and then uh, Coahuila y Tejas, uh, their, their legislator also said that they would not abide by this new constitution. So at first Santa Ana sent an army and himself he himself led it to Zacatecas and crushed the Zacatecan state militia and forced them under his new constitution. And then since then he heard word that the Americans in, in Texas, that the Coahuilans had largely backed down in Saltillo, uh, but the Americans in particular, American areas of Eastern Texas were not backing down and were even arming themselves. And so he sent his army up and on the way up uh, they had um, confiscated a few different uh, presidios or military forts and took over their cannon. And one of them was Perfecto de Cos, the leader, the local Mexican leader who was the, happened to be the brother-in-law of Santa Ana. And he ordered them to step down and to back away from the presidio. And instead they fired upon him. So he came down and told Santa Ana and Santa Ana decided he needed to make a lesson of these, uh, these Texans. So at any rate, he came up and then in late February to the first six days of March, uh, he besieged the, the famous Alamo, right? A-L-A-M-O in San Antonio. And uh, he ended up killing all of the people in the Alamo. There were about 200, um, killed all of them and word spread. And William Barrett Travis, who was like the leader there in the Alamo, he sent word to um, uh, Mississippi and Alabama in particular uh, sent a famous circular letter uh, decrying uh, the corruption and the tyranny of Santa Ana, and he wanted liberty-loving Anglos to come in and help them fight for freedom and wrest uh, Texas from the arms of Mexico. And so lots of people flooded in and fought for Sam Houston, and Sam Houston um, attacked at the most unlikely time when the three armies of Santa Ana um, ironically united and they, the, the idea, right, with uh, Sun Tzu and the art of war is that you sometimes hit the enemy when he knows he's strong because he puts his guard down, not expecting it. 
And so that happened and um, <clears throat> at uh, San Jacinto, uh, J-A-C-I-N-T-O, they captured Santa Ana and in exchange for his life, he signed Texas over. This happened in 1836, in the summer of 1836. And so from 1836 to 1840, the end of 1844, right, uh, Texas was its own Lone Star Republic, its own country. But the Mexican government warned the United States, don't touch Texas. We're going to get it back in time. And so under President Tyler, who got kicked out by his own Whig party because he was too much of a Democrat, like a Southern Democrat, uh, John Tyler asked Congress to, um, uh, a, what, what's the word, annex, basically, there's a, there's a more official word. Uh, that's eluding me right now, but to annex uh, Texas as a new state, to incorporate it as a new state. And so when that happened, they had already had two attempts uh, by uh, Tyler and then by James K. Polk, the newly elected president of the Democratic Party, uh, whereby they tried to uh, buy, purchase the far west from Mexico for 15 million. And Mexico considered it, the government considered that an affront. Uh, a great affront to their uh, to their culture, uh, to their dignity, et cetera, and asked the diplomats to go home. And so you had tension over that. And then the last thing was, is Polk arguably picked a fight over the border between Texas and Mexico um, by uh, the Spanish treaties. And with the Mexican uh, uh, treaty, there was a bit of a disparity, uh, but it seemed like the, the Mexican government was in the right with it being the Nueces River. And instead, uh, he contended that it went further south uh, to the Rio Bravo del Norte, or the Rio Grande, as we call it. And what's funny is that land between the Nueces and the Rio Bravo uh, is some of the most barren land on the continent. And yet we fought over that stupid land. And so um, the Spanish, the Mexican troops came to the Rio Bravo or the Rio Grande, the American troops crossed the Nueces, which the Mexicans considered an invasion of their territory, to the Rio Grande. And they had a standoff for several days until a, a cavalry unit of the Americans was fired upon and a handful of them were killed. And Polk ironically tells Congress, American blood has been shed on American soil and contends that something needs to be done about it. But he made no bone about it that he wanted uh, California. So at any rate, um, the Mexican-American War happened, and then right at the end of it, you had the gold rush. And you have in the primary sources of the Spanish newspapers of 1848, you do have evidence of a lot of minerals and uh, gold uh, being dug up at the superficial level by people with no expertise and no uh, tools, no capital, no money necessary, but just digging it out through primitive means and so some people did achieve the American dream who got here first, who got here early, right? But some of those who got here early were already Mexican Californios or Mexicans who beat the rest of the people traveling over 2,000 miles across the overland trails. They beat them to the punch, uh, particularly those in the northern states like uh, Sinaloa, um, uh, the, the Mexican Sonora the Mexican immigrants came in more quickly and beat them to the mines. Even the Chileans got here early and uh, they had good use of mercury or quicksilver and they were, it was highly coveted how successful they became as well. And so then it didn't take long for there to be popular anger directed toward the Hispanics contending that Americans uh, won California by, by the Mexican American war and that that mineral wealth was theirs and not the Hispanics. So there was economic rivalry and resentment, right? Not to mention that greatly outlasted the gold rush with Anglo and, and Irish immigrant and other uh, Euro-Americans who uh, competed with Mexican-Americans for jobs on the railroads, uh, on the plantations, in the mines, et cetera. Not to mention also with the Chinese. So there was a lot of economic competition underlying this as well, but it seems to have exacerbated evidence for an already existent racism, uh, prejudice against those demographics as well. 
And then it didn't take long for that, um, that popular anger uh, to grow into the fruition of laws. And so there were uh, miners' laws, right? Um, foreign miners' laws. In 1850 and 1852, one was clearly directed toward Hispanics and the other one was clearly directed toward Asian Americans or Asian immigrants. All right, so you should see evidence of this on number two. Number two goes against Turner's thesis. Number one tries to support it, that the West was an egalitarian area that was equally dangerous, but afforded equally, uh, you know, uh, growing opportunities, uh, economic opportunities for the common person. And number two says, no, uh, racism alone ensured that Turner's thesis does not hold water. Another common avenue toward the American dream was mining the miners, for instance, finding something that the miners coveted or needed and providing that good or service to them for money. All right, but there's plenty of evidence that the wealthy, it didn't take long. And by the early 1850s, the wealthy alone were extracting most of the wealth from the mines because it required heavy machinery like uh, hydraulic water powered or pneumatic uh, air powered drills that the average person could not afford. So it didn't take long and you have like the Anaconda company and these other big corporations that hired people who had come to achieve the American dream by way of the gold rush. And instead, um, you know, found that they had to work for hourly, low hourly wages and do dangerous work for a mining corporation instead. And then the Americans coming in, taking and seizing land from the Mexican Americans, uh, they did it be by way of um, just bullying and, and violence or threat of violence. And they also were able to get by in the courts on many occasions, sadly, uh, because uh, for one squatter's rights, a lot of Hispanic landowners owned a lot of land and they were pastoral. And so hence you had land um, you know, like driving up 108, you see the hilly land and you wonder, is this privately owned? Is it public domain? And it doesn't seem to be inhabited by anybody. And so hence they said, hey, no one's on it. No one's working it. No one's improving it. And so they granted, were granted squatters rights by properly elected judges who wanted to stay popular and win re-election and go with the majority of Anglos and what they wanted. And so uh, judges granted squatters rights to a lot of people, and that carved up the big domains of the big Hispanic owners uh, who lost big chunks of their lands. So like the Nieto family down in LA and other uh, families that had a, a lot of land, had a lot of it gobbled up, including Vallejo himself. You had corrupt uh, and greedy attorneys who would, who would demand real high fees, and when they couldn't pay those fees, they had to give up land on collateral as payment to their lawyer. There are many ways in which uh, Hispanic people lost their land when, when the border crossed them. All right, so any questions? So technically I've covered the, the next two assignments. All right. Yeah, I will make an announcement about the, the final Zoom. I need to check and make sure that, that that is true, which it very well might be. Let's see here. So we end, the, the last day is the 24th, all right, today's the 14th, goodness gracious, yeah.
So uh, what I'm going to do, it looks like, okay, is I'm always eager to help you. I really am. So uh, whatever I cannot cover in a Zoom, as far as an assignment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach into my arsenal of previous semester um, lectures and Zoom meetings on those topics and just post them for you. So it won't be you. It'll be a previous semester's class that I'm interacting with but it's covering the material that you need to know, okay? And I will certainly meet on Wednesday. I apologize that I cannot on Monday, but I will try to make up for it, like I said, by way of um, previous semester Zoom videos or lecture videos. Okay. So also don't forget, right? I believe your quizzes are due on the 17th. That's just in three days. So don't forget that, okay? In three days, your, your textbook quizzes are due. So don't wait too long to do that. Make a note of it. All right, are there any other questions? You can do this, guys. We're getting toward the end. Uh, professor, I do have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I I did see the we had like a small little chat space area on Canvas about reaching you through email. I don't know if that was addressed at the beginning of the class because um, I joined a little like 15 minutes late. But um, are you going to be consecutively available through email throughout this week? Yes. What I would recommend, uh, oftentimes I get an email through an announcement. But if you would please give me Canvas announcements. Okay. My I I I have I I've been having issues with my email. Uh, Canvas announcements. I have no excuse. Okay. Okay. So if that's okay with you, if if that's if that's attainable, uh, please yep. give me Canvas announcements. Canvas announcements. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you, and sorry. All right, so anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, Robert. All right, you guys hang in there, okay? You guys hang in there and I'll do my best to, uh, to put videos up. And I look forward to meeting with you next Wednesday, okay? So hang in there and I'll continue to communicate via announcements. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and end the session. Is that okay? No meeting Monday. That is true. Yeah, I apologize. I'll be out of town. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, okay? Thank you.